Last time on Improv Tabletop, we met our new trio of misting heroes, Shrew the Wasteful, Bartholomew the Keen, and Ellis the Mystic, all of them woodland critters living in the Breezeway, an abbey that was once a place of great hope and joy in the middle of the forests, now a mere shadow of itself, where a few brave souls are holding out against the mists that have come in from places unknown, that are withering the earth and holding back its bounty. But with those mists have come great powers. Our friends, as they eat different cheeses and as they melt them in their stomachs, they are able to exhibit great magical powers. And we found them at a somewhat somber feast at the Breezeway. They were celebrating basically just getting by with a very, very meager offering for all of the friends there. But after a while, a new individual came bursting in through the door, Lord Melis the Wise, the Lord of the Badgers, with a very disconcerting bit of news that along with the mists has arrived a pirate lord, a weasel named Mustel the Stenchful, who has the ability to melt not one cheese, as all of our heroes here can, but all of the cheeses. That's right. Mustel the Stenchful is Milkborn. <laughs> and with this revelation ringing in their ears, how are our heroes going to stand up against this weasel pirate lord? Let's find out here on the world of Miceborn. What's shaking, everybody? You're listening to Improv Tabletop, the Fate RPG actual play where we make up everything on the spot. I'm Ned Wilcock, your host and GM, and today I'm joined by... Connor Wood, celebrity backflip connoisseur. Christian Randall, the inconsistent. And Thomas, who just discovered what oubliette means. <laughs> Powerful. <laughs> Sounds like you're having a great time over there. <laughs> I am. I mean, there's like a lot of literacy going on, not only in this campaign, but in my life. <laughs> well, hopefully our heroes can avoid getting thrown into an oubliette on that terrible dread pirate ship that has just showed up on the shores. We're going to pick up, like I said, Lord Melis has just announced the shocking revelation about this person who's trying to hoard all of the cheese in the world for himself. There's just silence going all throughout the hall until finally Abbot Lepus says, This, this cannot be possible. There have only been rumors, legends about individuals who can melt all of the cheeses. I fear that your blood wrath has clouded your vision, my old friend. And Lord Mellis takes that sword and slams it flat down onto the great table here and says, Tell that to all my friends who lie with their bodies cold on the sands. I speak softly but firmly. He speaks truth, Abbot, for I have seen this lord. And you can hear the Abbot. He's like at the head of the table and you're kind of at the foot of the table since you're the castaway. And you just hear him like, uh, Tell us <laughs> about your vision, Ellis. <laughs> I was staring into the mist, seeing its swirling patterns, and without meaning to, I talked to the mist. As I breathed out, my breath mimicked the mist of itself and formed the image of the Lord, the Lord of the Pirates. And he had all the cheeses. He brought them under his own cloak and his arms wrapped around him, large and wide. He had an eye patch on his right eye and a grin that would make any heart turn evil if stared into long enough. And the abbot turns to Lord Melis and he says, You see what we've had to deal with since the mists arrived? Ugh, this one again. Are you done? <laughs> since when did you abandon reason into madness? <laughs> But before the abbot can even finish his statement, Lord Melis once again slams the flat of his blade down on the table and says, Abbot Lepis, I know that you have a good heart, but your mind is as rotten as that kasumatsu that your shrew eats. <gasps> and a gasp goes up through the entire hall and Lord Melis starts stomping his way, a little bit invigorated because of the soothing from Ellis the Mystic. And he approaches the abbot and says, there are greater things out there than you could imagine hold up here in your bastion. While you're in here trying to ignore what's going on outside, me and my people are on the ground. We are the ones who are clashing steel with the enemy. We are the ones who are falling and giving our blood back to the earth as it gives nothing back to us in return. You cannot stand here and say that your friend speaks madness when I have seen madness with my own eyes. <coughs> Question for you, not to speak out of turn. Of course not, what you got? Did the captain have an eye patch? That he did. Studded with rhinestones it was. And I look up at Ellis and I say, 
Oh, maybe you aren't as daft as they say. <laughs> I never thought you were daft. They just say that. Others, not me. At that acknowledgement and the eyes turning towards me, I hide under the hood just a little bit more. I tuck myself away to hide in plain sight. I'm gonna step up a little and say, yeah, I think the smart one's got a point. Uh, he's telling the truth. We gotta do something about this pirate. Otherwise, all the cheese is going to be gone, and I can't have that. <laughs> and Lord Mellis looks around the crowd, and he says, We need a group of brave individuals who can face up against this threat. For if he's not stood up to, he's going to crush the entire countryside underneath his aubergine patent leather boots. You have my Stilton. And you've got my baggage. <laughs> oh my gosh. <laughs> Ellis pipes up um, and pulls her hood down, and as she does, reveals that part of her hair has become partially white, almost as if it itself has become mist. And she goes, well, I don't know about bravery, but you have me as well. And Lord Mellis looks around at everybody else who's kind of shrinking back into their chairs, and he says, You say that you don't have bravery, but look at the lot around you, those who can't stand up for decency. I can't blame you for wanting to stay in your cushy castle here, but we're going to go out and we're going to save all your little patukuses and you better be grateful for it. As an aside with myself, <laughs> I, I just make a mental confirmation that we all agree that there's going to be cheese at the end of this. Um, oh, of course there's going to be cheese. I mean, we're not doing this pro bono. Yeah, no, 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 nothing pro bono. This is why you're the smart one. All right, back in the group. Uh, yeah, I'm in. Uh, let's do the right thing. If I could wink at myself, I would. <laughs> Point of order. Can our burly badger friend here melt cheese? Yeah, your burly badger friend can, in fact, melt Parmigiano Reggiano, the strongest of cheeses, which ah, is the equivalent of pewter, pewter in this world. Let's go. Could you use that in a sentence, please? Parmigiano. Parmigiano Reggiano is the only cheese that you should be grating on your pasta, except no substitutes. <laughs> <laughs> Good sentence. Decisive. Bold. Lord Mellis looks down at the three of you, looks up at the abbot and says, I apologize for speaking harshly but these are harsh times and they call for harsh hearts. And he turns around and begins to walk back through the doorway out into the mists. All right, Shrew, I'm gonna need your help here. Yeah. I'm gonna stop melting Stilton. And I'm gonna put my my paw, my mitt. Your claw? I'm gonna stick to the word mitt. That feels appropriate. <laughs> mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. I'm gonna stick my mitt on his shoulder. All right, yeah, I can lead you around for now. You're a good kid. Yeah, I know. Uh, all right, well, Ellis, in the mist we go, right? Onwards towards glory and beating the bad guy. And cheese. And obviously cheese. The mists will have to guide us, but I'm confident they will. And I walk forward and just envelop myself in the mists as I disappear. Oh. So mystic. Oh, yes. <laughs> So you all are following after Lord Mellis through the mists towards the front gate in the wall, and you reach the gatehouse, and you can see the person who is watching it tonight. Uh, it's a little lizard, and he looks at all of you as you're approaching, and he gives you kind of a half-hearted smile. You can see his lack of teeth, and he just goes, Oh gosh, guys, you're gonna go out there into the dreary wilderness all by yourselves? That's right, dummy. We're heading out. What's up, Thomas? <laughs> Ellis cocks her head and he's like, I feel like I've, I've met you before. No, no time for that. And uh, <laughs> just walks past. As you're walking past Gummy, the lizard, he's like, listen to I cast Fireball at the end of the 5e actual play. And you will understand this reference. <laughs> oh, what a deep cut. What a deep cut. I'm going to turn to Shrew and say, correct me if I'm wrong, but can a reptile eat cheese? I don't think so. I think they wear it. Let's not oh dive too deep into that right now. <laughs> the lizards are fairy chemists. Oh, yeah. oh my god. <laughs> That's the idea. My goodness. They're uh, fun, fondue chemists? I don't know. Fondue chemists? Oh my goodness. Connor Wood <laughs> is on a roll. That's it. <laughs> Seriously, guys, just read Mistborn. There's not just one awesome magic system. There's a bunch of them. Yeah. And if you want to understand these references, just go get it in your life. Anyway, they wear cheese. We won't get too much into that until book two. 
<laughs> well, we follow Lord Melis the Wise into the mist. Does he have any sort of like carriage or is he on foot or horseback or? Yeah, Lord Melis has been on foot, it appears. Well, so are we. Anybody know any traveling tunes or, I don't know, prayers? I might know some prayers. <laughs> oh, well, I know some tunes, so I think we should go with mine. <laughs> <laughs> You guys could do them at the same time. I, I would like to talk to the mist, so to speak, and try to ask it to clear a path before us or see if I can discern the best path forward. I know Melis the Wise is, uh, he's leading the way, but he probably didn't do the so entirely in the mist, and I'd like to help out where I can. Yeah, he got a little banged up on his way, too. We might want to find a path B. Uh, roll two, overcome with clever. It's a plus five. Plus Woo. five, yeah. You're walking through the mists. You're looking ahead of you at Lord Melis's back. And as you blink, his image changes from being this large hulking badger to being this very small shrew. Hmm. And you notice he's dressed a little bit more ragtag than your friend Shrew the Wasteful is. And he seems not to be walking along the path. He seems to have his legs straddled over a log canoe that he is paddling down the path. And he looks back at you and gives a little wink. And when you blink again, it goes back to being Lord Melis the Wise. Huh. Uh, did anybody have bad cheese? You. Well, no, I mean... <laughs> Lord Melis, might I suggest we take the river to our destination? Lord Melis pauses and looks down at Shrew, and he says, I, of course, all rivers lead to the sea. You, young one, you must have some connection with Logalog of the Shrews. Logalog? I try to not think too much about that name personally, but I think I've got some friends who know that name a little better. Aye, have you been kicked out of the Gwosim tribe of the Shrews? Uh, yeah, I guess you could say I'm banished more or less. <laughs> that complicates <laughs> things a little bit. Don't worry, you can hide in my satchel. Oh, great. Lord Mellis begins to tramp his way through the shrubbery. And yeah, those of you who have been in the area for a while, you have heard of the Gwosum Shrews. They are a river-dwelling band of shrews, and their leader is known as the Logalog, because they have these log, almost fairies that they ride around on up and down the rivers. And if you can get in good graces with the Logalog, then you've got some good transportation. All right, Ma. Only issue I see is I can't swim, so you're going to have to hold my hand. Don't worry, Bart, as I pat his head. We won't be leaving anybody behind. If you need, I can always disguise myself as a shrew and get us on their good graces. Uh, yes, shrew the wasteful. Are, are we, um, are we expecting trouble if we go to your ex-clan here? Um, only if they see me or find out you're harboring me. I see. I mean, I stole from everybody. Oh. <laughs> Let me make that perfectly clear. I have offended every individual there. That, that does complicate it quite a bit. Yeah, but I, uh, I mean, I'm a little guy. I can fit right in the Bag. You didn't steal from anyone at the breezeway, did you? I stole from everybody. <laughs> um, <laughs> not you guys. Not de definitely not you guys. I was just clarifying. Yeah, <laughs> yeah, well, uh, yeah. So we'll be fine. I am just gonna. Um, I'm in the bag. <laughs> <laughs> All right. You climb up into Melis's satchel. Now, as you guys are traveling through the mists, which of you has the highest clever? That would be Bartholomew, right? Yeah, and I stopped burning my Stilton, so if we need a little bit of direction, I can always burn a little more, or sorry, melt a little more while it's still <laughs> in me to give us a, a more keen sense of direction. Yeah, so Lord Mellis, as you've been traveling, like every so often he'll ask you to melt a little bit of Stilton so that you can just make sure that everything's going all right. And at one point, as you're getting pretty close to the river, as you're melting your stilton, you hear rustling in the underbrush off to the side of you. You can hear that it seems to be traveling at the same pace that you guys are, just off on a parallel path. I think we're being followed. Um, does Lord Mellis react to this? Is he aware of this at all? Yeah, hearing Bartholomew speaking to Ellis, he takes a big inhale and reaches into his satchel and he pulls out a wedge of Parmigiano Reggiano and a microplane and starts grating it into his mouth. <laughs> This is so much better than ingesting metals. Yeah. You have to like have your tools with you specifically to make sure you get your cheese out. Your hard cheeses, your soft cheeses. Yeah, you've got in 
instead of physical and mental, you've got hard and soft. <laughs> crumbly cheeses are really hard to work with. Yeah. Do I have a crumbly cheese? Uh, Stilton, it's a pretty crumbly cheese, yeah. No wonder things have been so hard for me, but it reminds me of the earth. Mm -hmm. I like it. But as he's finished chomping down his parm, he looks down towards you and says, can you make out what kind of critter it might be? In this moment of a need to be certain, I would like to flare my Stilton really quick and see if I can't roll to sniff it out. Faux show. Sure. Roll to overcome with clever. That is a four. Very nice. So you, as you flare your Stilton, are starting to sense the movement patterns of this creature off to your left. You can hear that the front paws, it seems to be down on all fours trying to sneak. The front paws are pretty far from the rear paws, so you get a sense of this being a ferret or a stoat, a weasel-like creature. But also with this plus four, you can hear what you didn't hear before, off to your right, parallel from this weasel or this ferret, whatever it might be, much, much softer footsteps, a more trained sneaker. And you've never known any creatures to be so stealthy other than the foxes. I'm pretty sure we're going to be attacked from both sides by a fox and, uh, ooh, greater to my head, I'd have to say stout. <laughs> okay, well, they're not shrews, so stealth doesn't matter too much with me here. Um, I am going to... My idea right now is I have a smart one and a strong one I can communicate with. I'm going to try and pass things off to the strong one, or at least just get him on deck and draw some daggers. All right. You kind of tag your other personality here, pull out those, like, I imagine they're kind of curved blades, kind of janky looking. Yeah, they are sharpened paper clips. <laughs> <laughs> Perfect. And as you continue along, Bart, you can hear them starting to come in closer and closer, this sort of pincer movement and you figure it's only going to be a very short amount of time before they're on top of you. All right, team. I'm going to hang back and see if I can't infiltrate. You take the head-on approach. And I'm going to pull up my disguise kit and pull on my rat disguise mm -hmm. and try and back up and make it seem like I'm going to join them. I'm just a rat who happens to see them and, and join to see if I can't take some of the spoils and join their crew. All right. You kind of hold back the rest of you continuing to walk along with bated breath, listening intently, waiting for the first sign of attack. And eventually you hear kind of a whooshing noise coming from off to your left and you see rocketing through the mists, leaving swirling vortexes behind it, is a hunk of cheese flying through the air. Let me see who it's going to be going for. It's going directly at Lord Mellis's satchel, actually. <gasps> it appears that whoever's been following you has noticed that Shrew is hiding in that satchel. It's a cheese pusher. <laughs> yeah, the cheese that gives this ability. So in Mistborn, if you burn steel, you're known as a coin shot and you can physically push metal away from you. In this world, it's going to be Epoix de Bourgogne, I think is how you pronounce it, which has a reputation of being the smelliest cheese in the world, a very repulsive cheese, uh -huh. as it were. You catch that smell coming from off to the left as this cheese comes rocketing through the air right at Shrew the Wasteful. How would you like to try and defend against this attack? Got my little daggers at the ready. I'm going to try and just shish kebab the cheese. <laughs> All right. That sounds like a pretty quick maneuver trying yeah. to get that reaction time in. The stoat over here is attacking with sneaky, trying to hit you from the unseen location. All right. I got a positive four. Dude, he also got a positive four. Ooh. Oh, mamma mia. So on a tie for an attack, he wouldn't do any harm to you, but would gain a boost. Okay. The boost that I am going to give to this assailant is beware the stench. Ooh. Yeah, you reach up and you skewer that piece of cheese at the last moment and you give it a little whiff and it's like, oh yeah, that's that's the strong stuff. Oh. That's the bad stuff. <laughs> and that's coming from the guy who likes the maggots. So. <laughs> now that we have entered into our exchange here, I'm going to have the stoat pass it off to Shrew. Okay, I am not that attached to this dagger, so I throw the one that has the really stinky cheese on it away, and now I'm power stancing my one dagger. I am gonna just try and leap full force out of this bag at one of these assailants, whoever's the closest. Yeah, you follow the trajectory of that hunk of cheese that came rocketing towards you. You can still see that thin area where it displaced the mist and it hasn't yet been filled in. 
and you can tell, all right, that is exactly where my assailant is hiding. Yep, go in that direction. Yeah, leaping out towards them, I'll say, since you're inside of the satchel and you're suddenly just like, boom, leaping towards them, that seems pretty sneaky to me, I'll say. Radical. And Stoat's going to try and defend with quick. That is a plus five. Stoat got a plus three. Woo! So yeah, you leap through the mists and you feel your dagger connect with something on the other side and you hear this Stoat give out a little gasp of shock, looks down and kind of shakes you off. And you are on the ground, like feet akimbo, looking up at this stoat, and it begins to lift itself up to its full height. And it's, uh, you know, stoats are, they're long boys. They are so long boys. So he's got quite a bit of height on you and reaches into its pack and pulls out a bunch of rinds from like a wheel of Parmesan. Very, very small, very hard. <laughs> this is brilliant. Oh boy. All right, well, from here, I guess I will try my best to assume a decent stance and pass it off to our mystic. Booyah, but you did get two stress on him as well. So Woo-hoo! good hit there. Um, I'm not really much of a fighter, but I would like to rely on, almost said rely on my skills and training, hey. <laughs> would, would like to rely on my Swiss and start burning and trying to soothe away any sort of fear that Lord Mellis or anxiety has, as well as my buddy Shrew. I don't know where Bart is, but Shrew, who I know is in that direction, I'm going to try to get both of them down if at all possible. Yeah, go ahead and roll to create an advantage with flashy you're melting your swiss you've got kind of that light coming out of your eyes so yeah we'll create that advantage plus two all right so you've successfully created the aspect and you're going to get one free invoke on it mm-hmm. the aspect that i'm going to create is just going to be called all is peace all is calm mm-hmm. any of you can now use this aspect and there is one free invoke that any of you can use at any time Your mystic helps, kind of. With that aspect created, Ellis, who would you like to go next? I'd like to toss it to the unknown assailant on the other side. All right. You hear the sound of sprinting footsteps, very, very quick footsteps, very light, not making a ton of noise, but now they're moving so fast you can't hear it, moving around to the front of the pack. And Lord Mellis has his sword out and is looking around, trying to follow that. And he doesn't notice that down at his side, the dagger that Shrew had dropped, the one that still has the chunk of cheese on it, begins to lift from the ground directly towards Ellis. So it seems that this fox is also pushing the cheese towards you. Cool, 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 cool. And this one has a dagger attached to it. So they're going to (laughs) attack with forceful Ellis. How would you like to defend? I'm going to have to try and go for quick. Just it's such a gut reaction. I think I'm just going to try and have to dodge out of the way. Yeah, go ahead and roll to defend with quick. It's a plus two. The attacker got a flat zero. Nice. Nice. So you duck your head out of the way just in time. The blade kind of sings past that hair on the top of your head that's starting to go white and clips like a couple of them as it flies past and you hear it thunk into the tree behind you, the point driving itself all the way through the cheese and into the wood of the tree. Oh gosh. (laughs) Wow, that was close. All right. The fox is going to pass it over to Bart. Seeing that we're dealing with some other masters of the lactic arts, I am going to take a little bit more Stilton out of my pouch, pop it in, and start burning it so I can go ahead and find out where they are. I'm going to try and give away the position of the fox, if possible, since he's a little more sneaky. So I'm going to try and find the fox, and then, disguised as a rat, come up and say, Hey, friend, what are you doing out in the woods this time of night? Looking for an easy catch? so I can show our friends where he is, and then I'm going to try and trip and fall into him with my shovel that I always carry with me because I'm a mole. Yeah, I'll say go ahead and roll to create an advantage for your friends. Do that with... Yeah, we can make that clever. You're using your disguise to try and expose this guy. That is a plus four. Plus four. That is two free invokes, creating a new aspect on your assailants, and that aspect is exposed. Nice. You guys get two free invokes on it. Yes. 
Sick. And remind me, who hasn't gone in this exchange yet? Uh, Melis is the only one. Then Melis is up. Yeah, so Melis, now that he knows where his enemy is, you see his muscles begin to bulge and to ripple underneath his armor, and you can see that blood wrath beginning to coat over the front of his eyes as his vision goes scarlet. And he takes that great sword and he shouts out, Eulalia! And goes rushing directly towards the fox and is going to roll to attack this critter with forceful. Yeah. Getting a plus three. Get him. We're going to see how the fox does to defend with quick. It gets a plus three as well. Can we have Lord Melis use one of the invokes? Yeah, he's going to use two of them, actually. He's going to yeah, use one of the three is. invokes on Exposed mm-hmm. and the one three invoke on All is Peace, All is Calm, bringing that to a plus seven. Do it. He rushes in with his great sword and he just lifts this fox up off the ground, oh. 30 feet up into the air. 30 feet? Yeah, that's that parmesan that we love. <laughs> yeah, it goes flying, just pinned wheeling through the mists and it lands flat on its back and you hear this crunch as it lands <laughs> and takes four stress from that attack and you hear the fox just like oh goodness oh I wasn't expecting that today <laughs> <laughs> and so yeah now that Lord Melis has completed his attack we're going to pass it back to the stoat the stoat hearing the great dismay that its friend is currently in is going to rush up to the situation just leap over shrew he looks and he sees the person who gave up their location and is like Oh, you giving up our location like this? Mustel the Stenchful would have you drawn and quartered, so I think I'll just save him the pain of having to do it himself. And is going to stab you with a few of those Parmesan cheese rinds. Ooh, not great. <laughs> He's doing, it's kind of like the Dai Li, where they've got their earth gauntlets, and they just shoot like piece after piece. Yes. Yeah. <laughs> so he's just firing one after another all of these Parm rinds at you. Is going to roll to attack with Flashy. How would you like to defend? I would like to take my mitt and stick it through the handle of my shovel, and then start spinning it like a fan. Mm. Create a little shovel shield to try and block him from hitting me. Shovel shield. <laughs> yeah. I'll say let's roll to defend with quick to see how fast you can deflect all of these bullets coming at you. All right. Don't you love it when you roll a natural plus four, boys? Whoa. So that is a plus five. Very nice. This guy only rolled a plus one. <laughs> so on success with style to defend, not only do you not get hurt, you also gain a boost. The boost that I'm going to give to you is, we'll just call it sword dancer because that sounds cool. I look at my shovel and I'm like, wow, I didn't know you could do that. That does it for the stoat. Let's pass it over to Shrew. This guy just leaped over you. What are you going to do in response to that? I'm going to show him the definition of opportunity of attack. And uh, (laughs) does Expose have any invokes left? Still has one free invoke, yeah. All right, yeah, just right off the bat. Just going to go with that. And I'm going to try and get a good backstab in. All right, go ahead and roll to attack with Sneaky. He's going to defend with Quick. He's just trying to get out of your range as fast as he can. All right, I got a positive three. He only got a plus two. Did you include your invoke? Oh, uh, no, that is... Okay, so that brings it up to... That's what? uh, Plus two or plus one? Plus two. Okay, so positive five. All right. So you reach up, and right as he's leaping over you, he exposes his soft underbelly, and you reach up with your dagger, and you just, like, let the tip drag along his stomach (laughs) as he's leaping. (laughs) There's this line of crimson that goes down the front of his body. He grits his teeth to hold back the pain, but you deal three stress to him, and he is not looking very great at all. Oh, yeah. It's all coming together. Get him, Bartholomew. I'm going to kind of pull back my rat disguise and be my good old mole self. And I'm going to saunter over to the fox on the ground and say, Now, where was that Vegas nerd? Wow. And then I'm just going to take my shovel and whack right okay. on his head. Okay. I mean, since you're trying to go for a uh, very called shot based off of your medical knowledge, apparently... I'll say that can be a clever attack. Well, you know, when us moles are down in the tunnels, we have to be well-versed in first aid and second aid and all of the aid because sometimes people just can't get to you. Yeah, the fox is going to try and defend with quick to see if you can roll out of the way in time. All right, that is a plus three. Only got a plus two. Oh, gosh. So I'll just bring that shovel right down on his head. Yeah, you 
bop him and you can see a couple of like as the shovel moves away it's kind of like that trick that people do where they like put their hand in front of their face like they've got a smile before they do and when they pass their hand in front now they've got a frown (laughs) the shovel goes in and there's a look of fear and when the shovel is removed just this doofy grin missing teeth eyes pointing off in different directions (laughs) this guy takes one stress and is also looking quite rough at this point So with that, the fox will take his reaction. Yeah, the fox, feeling the intensity of that hit, shakes his head, recomposes his face, and then rushes over to the stoat and says, This ain't worth it. A fox who fights and runs away lives to fight another day. And you see drops some more of those parmines onto the ground, grabs his friend, and then pushes off into the mists and starts sailing through the treetops. So that's what this guy is going to do. Ellis, is there anything you want to do in response to that? Can I still see the fox? You can. They're quickly departing, but haven't made it out quite yet. I would like to just blast the fox with a flared soothe to just drain them of all emotion if possible. Ooh. Okay. And okay. just shock the senses. Yeah, roll to attack with flashy. Gonna defend with clever to see if you can stave it off. Okay, and I'm going to use two fate points as well. Uh, The first one I'm going to use is I talk to the mist as he's flying away in the mist and it's starting to envelop him. I whisper and say, help me. Help me, my wispy friend. (laughs) Ellis is not that clever, but (laughs) she she just gets right down to the point. And actually, I'm just going to use the one right now to see what the result is. Uh, That's going to be a plus seven. What? (laughs) A plus seven. What's the result, I wonder? The fox rolled plus one. (laughs) Oh, that was close. So yeah, you reach out into the mists and it's almost like the mists arrest the limbs of the fox as it's trying to fly through the air. You see it just go limp. You could see like the shards of cheese that it was pushing off against were pressing down into the loam and they go slack and you see the fox and the stoat beginning to fall to the ground. The fox is just completely ragdoll, like, oh yeah, this is fine. <laughs> the stoat is like, oh, no, 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 no. <laughs> but yeah, I know technically you're only supposed to be able to target like one opponent at a time, but with six shifts of stress, they each only had one stress left. <laughs> I think as they both land on the ground, you can hear a couple pained moans coming from the heap that they've landed in but they're not getting back up. I sort of dropped one knee with the effort uh, having flared and uh, taking a little bit of out of me. So I am going to have Melis the Wise toss it to them. See what he does. Yeah, he just stomps over to the area where these two are just groaning in the pile. He picks them both up by the scruff of their necks and bops their skulls together. And (laughs) the bodies just go completely limp. He takes out a rope and starts tying them up to a tree. And he says, I don't know if the stenchful's going to be sending any people after these forsaken wretches. But if he does, we'll leave a message for him. And after he's finished tying them up, he takes his sword and he just cuts off one of each of their ears. And he grabs a couple sharp stones from the ground and with his strength from burning his Parmigiano Reggiano, just pins the ears to the trees up above these two (laughs) fallen enemies. Oh my goodness. You don't mess around. Yeah, Melis, I will never steal from you. (laughs) (laughs) I'm going to kind of just saunter across the road and pat Ellis on the back as I walk by. Good job, Ma. Decent move there. I'm going to take my shovel over my shoulder and plant it in the ground in front of the tree and and say, all right, so we're going to bury them dead or alive. It's it's sort of up to you here. (laughs) Oh, my gosh. Um, uh, As Bart walks by me, I quickly cover my hair. It's a little bit more has become white, Mm. and I quickly cover it with the hood. Intrigue. And I go, we don't need to bury them. We've incapacitated them. Oh. Goodness me. Do you think they are more of like a burning their dead kind of society? (sighs) Bart. Burial at sea. Throw them in the water. Bart. And Melis comes over to you, and he's still breathing heavily. You can see that his eyes are starting to fade away from the redness, but it's a slow process, and he's like, What you're thinking is too quick for the likes of these. What they deserve is to rest here tied to this tree, unable to get themselves away from the carrion crows and the ravens as they peck at the flesh. 
Oh, yeah, no, I've, I've heard of burials like that. Yeah, they'll break the bones, make it easier for the birds to digest. So I take the shovel and I break some kneecaps really quick before Bart's I walk like, away. No, <laughs> you don't want them to choke on the bones. He's got a point. This is why they call him Bart the Keen. Yeah, if you if you rearrange Keen, it'll spell knee. That's why I take out the knees. Bart. Oh my goodness. <laughs> Bart, well let the mists decide their fate. The mists have decided they have broken kneecaps. <laughs> oh <my God. laughs> and Melis comes up to Bart and just like pats you on the back with his massive paw and he's like... <laughs> I didn't know you had it in you, young one, but I'm impressed by your pluck. <laughs> I'm not the squeamish type. I've seen some things down in the tunnels we dig, and I'll put my shovel back over my shoulder and start jauntily walking down the path again. We need a flashback of what he's seen down in the tunnels now. <laughs> <laughs> it's just like darkness and screaming and like earth falling around people. <laughs> Too horrific to reveal. Yeah, we'd have to up the rating if we showed it, so we'll just keep it at the black screen. And Melis looks at your two assailants now tied up to the tree, and he says, Well, I can hear the river not too far up from here. Follow along, young ones. And begins to walk, just dragging that great sword in the ground behind him, leaving a rift through the topsoil as he goes. All right, let's skip to our loo. <laughs> And as you guys are walking along, following Melis to the next leg of your journey, Ellis, roll to overcome with Clever real quick. <sighs> That's a one. All right. You're walking along and you have the distinct sensation of eyes burrowing into the back of your neck. You turn in the direction that you saw it and you see just a pair of eyes in the mist. A pair of eyes? No, one single eye. The other is covered and then in a blink they are gone miss protect us and i just huddle my cloak around me and stick close to lord mellis as i am terrified now <laughs> and huddled together the sound of the stream ahead of you that is where we're going to pick up next time Toy, toy. Oh, <laughs> guys. I feel like all the stuff that we've put out has been pretty good, but there are those moments where you feel like you've just got, it's like, it's one of those lightning in a bottle moments almost. <laughs> we've had a few of those on Improv Tabletop, and I feel like this campaign is one of them. I just <laughs> love everything about this. I'm jamming to this. This is way good. <laughs> it's a vibe. This may go on for three months, everybody. <laughs> oh, yeah, I would love so much to return to this world sometime in the future. Not a world of milk and honey, but a world of, of cheese and sleaze, if you will. Jeez. <laughs> With the dreaded milk horns. <laughs> <laughs> well, everybody, thanks for listening to Improv Tabletop, and we'll be back next week with more adventures in the world of Miceborn. If you want more, go ahead and subscribe. I mean, why wouldn't you want more? This is awesome. Yeah. Go ahead and subscribe, and maybe even give us a review. We would be just as happy as Lord Mellis was to give in to some of his blood wrath for a moment there if you would give us a positive review on the podcatcher of your choice. We're also all over social media at Improv Tabletop, so if you'd like to suggest either a setting for us to play in or an aspect for one of our characters to use, you can tweet about us or comment on one of our posts using hashtag ImpTab setting or hashtag ImpTab aspect. Let's do a round of plugs. As always, uh, like our friend Gummy the Lizard mentioned at the beginning of the campaign, <laughs> we have a sister podcast called I Cast Fireball, which is indeed the 5e actual play. If you want to meet one of my favorite NPCs of all time, Mud the Kobold, go check out that campaign. Thomas's portrayal of Mud, I think, is much better than mine. <laughs> and he definitely was not improv in the moment whatsoever. <laughs> improv? We don't do that around here. But yeah, go check out I Cast Fireball. So much fun. And Thomas mentioned earlier earlier he was about to say rely on my skills and training if you want to learn more about what that is a reference to listen to our avatar legends campaign it's a really really fun system and has a very creative way of using the power of bending in a way that's very free form it's not restrictive it's not proscriptive it just lets you use your bending as an extension of your character which is super cool the other thing that I would like to plug is, I mean, there's not much you can necessarily do about it now because the Kickstarter is long over, but Brandon Sanderson recently did a Kickstarter that was a big part of the impetus for us wanting to do a Mistborn-themed campaign. Blew all expectations out of the water. Most financially successful Kickstarter of all time. Twice over. <laughs> yeah, over double what the previous record had been. It feels so good to be a nerd, guys. Mm. <laughs> we truly are inheriting 
guarding the earth like I fight dragons once said. Mm -hmm. It is a good time. Yeah, go. I mean, we've said it a million times. Why haven't you done it by now? Just go read some Brandon Sanderson because it's amazing. Connor, is there anything that you would like to plug? Yep. I am reading The Great Hunt, book two of The Wheel of Time. Oh, it's real good so far. It's a good one. Where things ended with book one, I was like, okay, things are going to be a little cozy and calm for a while. And I was immediately wrong. So <laughs> Pleasantly. <laughs> yes, pleasantly so. The Wheel of Time is a great series. I've said it before. I'll say it again. I'm only a book and a half in. But it's marvelous. Good job, Robert Jordan, and eventually Brando Sando, I'm sure. Indeed. Yes, another series that was inherited by Brandon Sando. Sanderson. <laughs> Christian, is there anything that you would like to plug? Uh, this week, I want to plug another book and also Michael Kramer and Kate Redding. Yes. Power narrator couple. They do a great job. Like I said, I love to sit down and read a good book. I don't find myself having a lot of the time to do that anymore. So audiobooks are a treat. I really enjoy Michael Kramer and Kate Redding. They do a lot of reading together. They are also actually together in real life. They are married. Um, I had no idea. Yep. Oh my gosh. <laughs> yeah, I believe they met doing doing The Wheel of Time, um, but they do most of Brandon Sanderson's books as well. Yeah, they do. I would like to plug a Michael Kramer book then called, well, it's a trilogy called The Lycanius Trilogy. I will say if you like The Wheel of Time, if you like Brandon Sanderson stuff, it's a lot of fun. Got some fun magic going on. The plot is twisty, turny, get your brain thinky, and I really enjoyed it. Nice. And then Thomas, is there anything that you would like to plug? Folks, I just want to plug storytelling. I want to plug literature and worthwhile stories. There's a lot of stories in the world that are fluff, um, that are trying to make money, but when you find a story that's worthwhile, it is transformative and it literally can change your world. Storytelling is not just for authors, it's not just for actors, it's not just for professionals, it's for everybody. It's for when you're tucking your kids in at night and they want a story and you don't have a book. It's when you're in a drive, it's when you want to do a wacky improv scene, it's everything and in between and it is just... As Ned stated, when you get to this moment where you have learned your type of storytelling, there's such a beautimous feeling that occurs when you can tell a story you feel that you're passionate about. And it's transformative, um, almost as transformative as reading any of Brandon Sanderson's works. <laughs> so I would highly recommend if you have any inclination to the arts, which I hope you do because you're listening to this, to either read up on storytelling and story structure and or take a storytelling class or lecture or something because it is 100% worthwhile. We had some great storytelling aspects. Most of us, if not all of us here, Trevor Hill taught us how to tell amazing stories and it has forever changed our lives. Yeah, and I'm trying to remember if I've mentioned this publicly on the podcast before, in case I haven't, and even if I have, it's something I want to repeat. Part of my intent with creating this podcast in the first place is a desire to lower the barrier of entry for people who want to get into this mode of storytelling. Because it's really easy to look at something like D&D that has so many rules and so many numbers and so many dice that you roll. And you look at people doing improv on stage and it's really intimidating the first couple times you see it. You're not sure you'd ever be able to do that yourself. You can just do what we did. You can go to Evil Hat's website, download the rules of Fate Accelerated for free, get together with your friends without having anything prepared beforehand, and tell an awesome, fun story. Even if that's just your first step, there is such a wonderful world ahead of you. Be a kid again, because we all told stories as a kid. Or else. <laughs> exactly. <laughs> this is an advice. This is a threat. <laughs> Somebody needed to bring us back to the ground after this heartfelt yeah, moment. I didn't mean to bring it to such a level there, but the, the passion was so strong. Well, thanks so much, everybody, for joining us here in the world of Miceborn and for fueling our passion for storytelling. I'm Ned Wilcock, your host and GM, and I've been joined by... Connor McDouglas Woodard, the cheese man cometh. Christian Randall, happy to plug you. And Thomas, may the mist protect you. Much love and stuff, everybody. We'll catch you next time on Improv Tabletop. There's this thing that happens in improv where every so often you just realize the absurdity of what you're doing. <laughs> like when one of your friends says, oh yes, we're also fighting against masters of the lactic arts. It's moments like that where I just go, what am I doing with my life? 
I think you are doing well with your life. That is the oh, answer. Thank You're you. walking the correct path. Winning. <laughs> yes. That is very generous of you. Oh, man. 